Hi and welcome to another story and today we have part 8 of Ned and the Chocolate Cheats by Mark Jarvis continuing from chapter 15, Too Much. The great Gabba and his gang had planned perhaps their most audacious robbery yet. They had left their home near to the Chocolate Hills and were all holding on tight with their strong fingers. They were on the top of the bus that was travelling to the integrated bus terminal at Island City Mall. Being so small, the Tarsiers had no fear of being spotted. It was the last bus of the day, so the light was fading fast. At night time, Tarsiers really wake up. Hey, Dink! I mean, Great Gabba! called one of the Tarsier gang, shouting across the roof of the rumbling bus. What is it we're all going to table down for? I know you told us we must all do as we are told, but it does seem a very long way. You'd better all listen carefully, gang, answered Dinky. We're going to our capital city because that's the place where it's at. He said this last bit in a New York sort of accent because he was trying to sound all gangster and street. Dinky looked around at the five other gang members. They were all clinging to the roof bars. He could see all their large eyes looking at him in the fading light. We all need mobile phones, right? The gang all answered in one voice, right. And Tag Bill Aaron is a busy place with lots of people, right? Right, the gang answered. And Tarsiers, with our super strong fingers, small bodies and our superb ability to see in the dark, make excellent pickpockets, perfect for stealing phones, right? Right, they all answered. Yeah, but why are we all going to Tag Bill Aaron? Asked one of the Tarsiers, nearly overbalancing as the bus went over a bump in the road. Sure, you're not serious, Dinky groaned. I give up. I thought I'd just explain that. Look, just follow orders, OK? We're here now, so as soon as the bus stops, we're going to jump off and hide until all the people have gone, OK? Get ready. And go! The bus came to a standstill, but before the doors opened, the Tarsiers climbed down the side until it was safe to jump. Dinky indicated that they should all follow him and took the them behind a nearby crate. Now what, boss? A Tarsier asked, who was hidden in the shadows. When no one is watching, we're going to sneak into the Island City shopping mall, which is the just, just next door. We shall commit what shall become known as the Great Phone Robbery. People will be talking about this momentous time for years to come. But Great Gabba, said another more sensible gang member, there are only six of us, right? And we can't possibly steal more than one phone each. Mobile phones are as big as we are, if not bigger. And your point is, said Dinky angrily, until now he had been rather proud of his plan. Well, it won't ever really be known as the great phone robbery, will it? I mean, six phones is not really a great number. There could be hundreds of people in the mall right now and six phones going missing. I'm, I mean to say, right, enough, interrupted Dinky. Enough talking. Let's get to work, guys, and do our thing. Uh, uh, what, Gabba? Oh, let's just go. Dinky said wearily, leading the way to the shopping mall. Five minutes later, the gang had all got come out again. They did indeed have a phone, but they didn't really steal it. They had found it on the pavement outside the bus station when someone had dropped it. The gang had all managed to enter the mall. It was getting dark outside and was all relatively quiet, but Dinky hadn't banked on the different conditions inside the mall. They had all sneaked through together as someone held a door open for, it for their child. As soon as the group entered, they all wished they hadn't. The lights, they were so bright. When you have eyes as large as a Tarsier's, bright lights in a shopping mall can be almost blinding. Next, there was the noise. Tarsiers have very sensitive hearing. The high volume of the music that was playing into the mall together with the noise of everyone talking and shouting it was too much for even Dinky to bear. Keeping their heads down and waiting for the next opportunity to occur, they crouched down in the shadows next to the door. Dinky didn't even shout. Go! When the door was held open again. They just all ran as fast as they could out into the darkness and quiet of the night. When's the next bus home, boss? asked one of the gang, all excitement gone from his voice right now. Dinky knew they would have to wait now until tomorrow night, unless... Dinky leant against the one phone they had managed to steal, that now stood propped against the wall. At least it was a smartphone. It wasn't locked and had lots of credit. It was in one of those cases that had a flap that folded over the screen at the front. The person who owned the phone had also kept their money tucked into the little pocket in the front flap. Let's go home now, Dinky said, to the surprise of his gang. We'll take a taxi. Chapter 16. Blowout. I stepped into the waiting lift and turned around to see my reflection in the mirrors, which were on the back of the closing doors. We had just left the highest bar in the world and were now making our way out of the building. Which button do you think I press? asked my person. The one with the lowest number on it. We're leaving the top floor and trying to get down to the ground again. OK, there we go. We're on our way down from ozone to the ground. Well, at least to the middle lobby first. Hold on to your tummy, exclaimed Jeff. What do you think about what we just heard up there, I asked. There's this great gabber. Do you think he is real? I got the feeling that they might just be making him up uh, as a way to trick the stray dogs into doing their dirty work for them. 
my tummy did a bit of, did feel a bit funny as we descended from 100 and on the 118th floor but we were soon down to the halfway point and the door opened again so that we could walk out into the white and shiny lobby we silently walked over to the other lift that would take us down to the ground the building was so tall that the lift needed to be in two stages when the lift doors closed behind us we continued our conversation yes i kind of agree said jeff but what if he is real we have been asked to find out and there is only one way to do that we need to go to bolho wherever that may be we'll need to get gizmo to check on poodle maps we eventually reached the ground and the lift doors opened onto the main foyer across the busy crowds of humans dogs and cats i caught a, a, a thought i caught a glimpse of a small and thin italian greyhound accompanied by a large hairy looking boris my heart gave a lurch of fear as i was sure that he turned briefly to look at us over his shoulder he might recognize us from london i hoped our disguises would work quick there they are i exclaimed we need to get after them i started forward but someone stopped stop chaps the words came from jeff but it wasn't him i turned to look the voice continued talking and i realized that it was coming from jeff's pocket you have left mi5 uh, can you can hear you switched on uh, i can hear every word i then recognized the voice as that of the man behind the newspaper jeff and i quickly darted to the edge of the reception area and stood behind another large tree in a pot i can hear every word chaps said the man behind the newspaper and there'll be no need to follow the blighters anymore for now we certainly have enough evidence to arrest them all thanks to your recording we're going to pass this information on to interpol the international police the people at near meeting are all known cheats who are wanted in lots of countries interpol will do the arresting what about us then jeff asked hoping that this great adventure was not over yet oh you chaps haven't finished by a long shot jeff and i looked at each other and smiled feeling excited again after bolho you go and find out about this gabba character he's still a person of interest as we say if he does really exist then he jolly well needs to be stopped now get back to your hotel get your things and have a word with gizmo on the way get her to look and book you a flight to bolho we can't hang about chatting you know he ordered come out coming out from behind the large tree in a pot we went out through the front doors we climbed into one of the many waiting taxis and showed the driver the address of the hotel on jeff's phone the driver sped through the busy roads of kowloon across one of the bridges to the even busier streets of hong kong island here we became stuck in congested traffic just used just you jeff used his phone to video call gizmo this time she was back in her usual place in the sticky bun cafe her wide cup of flat bright next to her dudes she exclaimed delightedly obviously pleased to see us you're alive hey my spy type pals how did it all go have you guys solved the chocolate mystery yet who did it that's loads of questions gizmo i said as i put my front paws up on my person to get a better view of the smartphone and we will answer them all eventually first though you need to help us again of course dude consider it already done uh what is it that you want done well said jeff brushing some of my hairs from his trousers onto the floor of the taxi firstly can you find out where bolho is he slowly peeled off his false moustache now as we spoke wincing a bit as he pulled against the very sticky glue that had held the disguise firmly to his face the taxi driver looked back at us in his rear view mirror and i could see his forehead furrow and his eyes widen in surprise i don't need to check for you dude interrupted Giz interrupted gizmo i already know it's in the philippines it's one of the many islands and it's popular with tourist type dudes hey you guys should leave that most excellent face furniture on she protested as i too pulled at my fake moustache i really think that you twos have found your new essential look but it's really itchy gizmo i answered i'll take it off carefully and use it again another time okay good jeff said you know where the place is so we can find out more later on the second thing is we need to go there can you book us some transport please using the mi5 credit card again you have all the details don't you apparently it needs to be as soon as possible no worries dude said gizmo as you can see i'm already searching on my laptop i'll text you the details of the bookings and where you need to go we heard the tap of the computer keys as gizmo closed the video call connection i tried to relax for a few minutes listening to the sound of the driver chatting to someone non-stop on his phone in chinese there were no animal seat belts in these hong kong taxis so jeff held me tightly as we swayed around corners i glanced out of my window and saw that in the lane beside us was a man pedaling very quickly on a bicycle it was an old-fashioned bicycle and the man was dressed in a traditional chinese working man's loose brown smock and three-quarter length trousers he also wore a pair of or a pair of white converse trainers he sometimes had to pedal quite fast to keep up with the traffic although he often put one foot down to stop as the congested traffic ground to a halt again 
What was most extraordinary was that sitting upright in the basket on the handlebars of the bicycle was a small white and fluffy cat. The cat was pure white and looked similar to the Hello Kitty children's toy. The cat seemed very relaxed about all the frantically busy beeping traffic that surrounded him. He even appeared to have his eyes closed and was permanently grinning. I poked Jeff with my nose and told him to turn and look too. What has that cat got in his mouth? Grip between his teeth, he asked, looking over to me to get a better look. It's a matchstick, I exclaimed. One of those with a red match head that you can strike on any surface. The man riding the bike doesn't seem to be in the least bit puffed out, even though he needs to, to pedal quite fast, Jeff observed. What are those two big gas cylinders on that rack on the front of the bike? What a strange way to transport gas. Whoa, he suddenly said in alarm. I can see now that it says acetylene gas on the side of them. It's got one of those explosive warning signs, to signs too. That's the gas they use for welding metal. That doesn't seem very safe. I wouldn't like to be that cat. No way, I said, fidgeting uncomfortably in my person's arms as the taxi moved on. They don't seem to have the same health and safety laws that we do at home. I wish they could move on and be a bit further away from them. They keep coming close to us and it doesn't feel very safe. The traffic stopped again and we paused beside one of the incredible basket works of bamboo scaffolding that covered the front of a building that was being repaired. The bamboo poles were only tied together with rope, but they were amazingly high. They looked rickety to me, but there were men working from them without harnesses. They were climbing around and confidently swinging on the poles to get to the high parts of the building. I was about to comment on a daredevil on the daredevil scaffolders when the cat on the bicycle pulled up beside us again as we stopped. Jeff tutted as he noticed too. At that moment, the chatter of the taxi driver that had been non-stop since we had left the Ritz-Carlton went quiet. I looked up and saw the alarm that the driver was opening the door and throwing himself out onto the road. Who had he been onto the, on the phone to? What took place next must have only taken a few seconds, to, but to me, it felt it, it, it seemed like slow motion. I heard a hiss of gas beside me and smelt a strange garlicky smell. I turned around to see that the man on the bicycle had shoved a pipe through the open window. He was using it to deliver gas from his cylinders into our taxi, filling the inside of the car. The cat was now facing us and still happily grinning. Jeff looked too. He suddenly realised what must be happening. He fumbled for the handle of the door, desperately trying to open it. it carry I carried on watching with horror as the man on the bicycle leaned forward and took the match from the grinning cat's mouth. The cat ducked a little as the match was struck on his head. The wooden stick was held still for a second to allow the flame to catch almost properly. Come on, get out, I shouted. The cat is trying to blow us up. At that moment, Jeff had the door open and grabbed me tightly. He pulled me across and flung me out of the stationary vehicle, tumbling out behind. We looked back as we heard what sounded like a Chinese swear word from the bicycle riding man. His match must have gone out, gasped Jeff. We need to get out of here quick. The would-be bombers must have changed their minds on realising we weren't in a taxi anymore. They cycled off through the traffic, cars behind us beeping loudly as our taxi now stayed still whilst all the other lanes of traffic moved on. Let's not hang about, remarked Jeff, scrabbling to his feet. Up here, look, away from the road, I'll help you. He gestured towards one of the wooden ladders that went up to the scaffolding and lifted me up onto one arm. He climbed the short ladder up to the first level that we could walk on. As soon as my paws touched the wooden walkway, we both ran along the bouncing and unsteady planks towards the other end of the building. The workmen were shouting and waving for us to get off, but we frantically ran on. This was not a good idea. The white cat, followed by the cycling man, had also climbed the scaffolding from the other end. They had seen what we were doing from the road and were now coming towards us. Ah! I let out a cry of alarm. We need to go up again, quickly! Pick me up like you did before! Jeff picked me up under his arm and started climbing. The ladder stuck out at my points, out at many points, and was tied on frayed bits of rope. Keep climbing, I gasped. Jeff's grip was tight as he needed to keep me safe, but it made it hard to breathe. They're following us up. The bicycle riding man had the grinning white cat sitting calmly on his shoulder whilst he climbed the, la the, la the ladders. He was a lot quicker than Jeff, having both his hands free. I'm going to have to put you down, Jeff croaked as he breathlessly dropped me onto another one of the creaky scaffolding boards. We seemed really high up now. We were six floors above the road, but it felt much higher as the scaffolding was swaying. It creaked and groaned worryingly. Over at the end, I puffed as we made our way carefully along the thin plank. I see one of those yellow plastic chutes that the workmen throw the building rubbish into. It takes the rubble safely down to the skip on the ground. Oh no, said Jeff. You're not seriously suggesting that we throw ourselves down there. That's exactly what I'm suggesting, I answered, now getting close to the chute's round opening. Have you got another plan? 
Jeff looked behind him at our pursuers, who were now also on our scaffolding level. They were quickly making their way towards us. Jeff's answer was to take one look at the chute's entrance and throw himself health head first into the yellow tunnel. I waited a second for Jeff to start his descent and headed after him. The chute was quite light, light inside, but it moved and rattled as our weight pushed it out of shape. We dropped quickly. The chute curved upwards very slightly as it approached the skip, and this was just enough to slow our fall. Even so, we were both dumped heavily into the skip, amongst all the dust, rubbish and building materials. It took a few moments for me to recover. Now what, I coughed. The cat will be down here in a minute. I don't know, responded Jeff suddenly, climbing out of the skip. The chute was your brilliant plan. We need to get lost among the crowds, I said, jumping down onto the roadside. This place looks extremely busy. It's a shopping mall. I pointed my nose at an automatic door that was opening and closing as different animals and people went into the mall next to us. Jeff looked puzzled for a moment, but must have understood my plan as he didn't argue and just went on through the entrance. He led me into all the crowds and queues. We went in as far as we could, ignoring the annoyed looks and protests of the shoppers as we barged past them. Only then did we look back through the glass doors. We saw the cycling man and then the cat, still grinning, pop out of the chute as we had done. They stood up on the rubbish to see where we had gone. We couldn't be seen from the skip and there was no clue that we had hidden her behind the crowds in the mall. The pair carried on searching for a few more minutes. The man shook his head and the, and the, at the grinning cat and the two of them hopped out of the skip. The cat quickly glanced into the mall entrance but they made their way off in the other direction. They were clearly baffled by our sudden disappearance. The cool air conditioning calmed me down and I felt able to think straight again. We can walk back to our hotel from here, said Jeff. I recognise this from when we walked down to the ferry, but I think we should wait here for a bit. Well, it's time for a flat bright, I suggested, and I sat down at an empty table next to the little chihuahua and her tiny pup. I think we both need to calm down a little first. I'm still shaking as I think about what nearly happened there, said Jeff, sitting beside me. If that gas from those cylinders had caught a light, the grinning cat and half of that building next to us would have been blown up too. That grinning cat was clearly crazy, I commented. Perhaps the great Gabba had told him to do it. Someone out there doesn't want us to share what we know about them. This must be a cheating operation that's worth big money. I paused and shuffled back in my seat, trying to catch the busy poodle dog waitress' attention. I caught sight of a very big lucky golden cat statue, which was waving with one paw and dominating the space in the mall. It made me think about how lucky we had been if the, the, that match did not light. I gulped and was eager to change the unhappy mood that we were both in. I know something that will cheer you up, I said grinning. It's another one of my cat jokes. If that crazy cat had succeeded in its evil plan, do you know what it would have been? It would have been a catastrophe. And that is where we will leave part eight of Ned and the Chocolate Cheats. I'll be back soon with the next part of this story and lots more coming your way. Lots of other stories, lots of other videos. If you'd like to subscribe or hit a like, that's always appreciated. Thanks for your support. Thanks for listening, guys. Goodbye.